So um, I just want to start today by real quickly going over the vocabulary quiz, um, which by and large everybody did really well on, right? But I find that if we go over it every Monday, it helps reinforce the information um, and um, it also helps to correct any inaccuracies um, people might have had on their quizzes and to give you better information for study going forward, right? Um, two things I do want to quickly note. One is that the answer for author and text will never be none, right? They will always be relevant to some text that we read for that day, um, but um, you might have to make that connection yourself. The other thing I want to note is that I do want, like, I didn't mark down for this this time, but in general, I want you to try to connect it to a text that we actually read. Right, so I know that, the, you know, we, we referenced a lot of texts last week that weren't actually assigned to you. What I'd like you to do is try to take the concept and apply it to something that we did read, right? So does anybody have any questions about that before we get started? Uh, and I do want to say, by the way, like, you guys rocked that first reading quiz, too, right? Um, on the whole, between the vocab quiz and the reading quiz, you guys are off to a stronger start than just about any section of this class I've had thus far. So, you know, give yourselves a little pat on the back, right? <laughs> you're, you're getting this. Okay, so what is the sublime? Yeah, go ahead, Gil. Isn't it the aesthetic of awe and terror? Yeah. Anybody care to elaborate a little bit? <laughs> so it's the aesthetic of awe and terror, right? It's usually like something big that would make someone feel insignificant or almost powerless by comparison. Yeah, it's something that your mind can't quite encompass, right, that makes you feel afraid. Either because it's too big or too incomprehensible, or what have you, right? And can we connect this to a uh, text? Now we know it's from Edmund Burke's um, you know, philosophical treatise on the origins of our perceptions of the sublime and the beautiful, right? But can we connect this to a course text? And there may be more than one right answer. I was gonna say the um Edinburgh, the, the, I think the name, Reflections on the French. Revolution. Okay, yeah, like Reflections on the Revolution of France. Okay, yeah. Like his description of how like, the people stormed the, like, the castle, or whatever, where, uh -huh. where um, Queen, what's her name, Marie Antoinette? <laughs> so, yeah, that description, <laughs> sublime, I'll describe it. Okay, yeah, he, yeah, he's definitely kind of using um, his descriptive talents, right? right to instill awe and terror in his reader by giving them this impression of like this orgy of violence, right? All right, yeah, good. So that's not the only possible answer here, right? But you know, when it's something that doesn't obviously immediately connect to a, cor to a course text, you gotta like try to think a little bit about how you might apply it, right? So good job, right? Um, okay, the three estates. What are the three estates? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, it's the social class system that was like in place during like the French Revolution, mm -hmm. right before. Yeah. Um, the first estate being like the clergy. Mm -hmm. The second estate being those who fight for the nobility. Yeah. And the third estate being those who work, so like the common people. Mm -hmm. The unwashed masses, yes. Right. <laughs> Everyone else. <All> right. <laughs> okay, good. So what, what text do we apply this to? Two that could work, right? Yeah. I want to say Mary Wollstonecraft's mm -hmm. hers and also Evan Burns. Yeah. 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 Mary Wollstonecraft's vindication of the rights of man would call this class system into question, right? right? And she specifically talks about the union of the first and second estates in oppressing the third estate, right? 
Uh, but you can also probably use Edmund Burke for this, um, in that he prefers maintaining the privileges of the first and second states, right? All right, good. Uh, horror. Say it with a little, like, a little bit of phlegm in the back. Horror. <laughs> horror. It's yeah. like makes supernatural very real. Uh huh. And it was shown in the monk. Okay, yeah, good. And who wrote the monk? Uh, Burke. Was it Burke? Not Burke. Uh, Matthew Gregory Lewis. Matthew Gregory Lewis. Uh, yes, good. Yes, good on you for the middle name there too. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Um, so, yeah, a, a tale of horror, right, is a gothic story in which the supernatural events are taken to be real, right? And the primary purpose or pleasure that you're supposed to take in the tale of horror is simply in being horrified, right? By all of the nastiness that occurs. All right, Gothic Follies. What were Gothic Follies? The fake ruins that were built in the gardens? Yeah, fake ruins and pagodas and obelisks and things like that that rich people built on their estates. And what text is this most relevant to and why? Yeah. Like Wollstonecraft because she mentions it like the rich use their land just for that and they could be using it for like food and stuff. Yeah. yeah. You, you could be growing food, right? But instead you're building bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, there were some um, wealthy people who actually who built like fake medieval grottos and would hire people would hire someone to live as a hermit in that grotto to make it more authentic. Like, this, is, this is the extent to which some of these wealthy eccentrics went, right? So <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they were going for a certain level of authenticity. All right, sensibility. What was sensibility? He said it was like receptivity to sense impressions. So when someone like, oh, there was a physical impact of like beauty happening. Yeah, yeah, sensibility is something you're kind of emotional receptivity to sense impressions, right? Good. So. Again, this is one that we could apply to a couple of different texts. So, where, what are some, what are some of the uh, directions we might go with it? probably apply it to um, the Aiken and Aiken essay, right? Where they talk about kind of the pleasurable, pleasurable feelings one gets from being left in suspense. Right. Um, and also to the Coleridge essay, right? Because he's worried about the moral effects of horrific tales like the monk on um, children. Yeah, on children, on, 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 on some, you know, someone of great sensibility, right? right. Might be, uh, yeah. <laughs> might be um, warped beyond, beyond redemption by reading something like the monk, right? Could also probably do something like this with um, Burke, the uh, Reflections on the Revolution in France, because as, you know, Wollstonecraft argues he's making more of an emotional case um, than a rational one, right? All right, but yeah, sensibility is a word that's gonna pop up a lot more, right? We're gonna be seeing a lot more of this especially in the late 18th, early 19th centuries. Um, okay, Marie Antoinette. Who or what is Marie Antoinette? 
Queen of France. Oh, yes. <laughs> she, she was the Queen of France. <laughs> um, up until certain certain events, right, that uh, shortened both her stature and her life. <gasps> she was the last Queen of France before the French Revolution. Yes. Um, she was captured along with her husband and mm -hmm. beheaded uh -huh. because of um, the unfair and unbalanced life in France during that time. Yes. They were throwing elaborate parties while he was starving. And she told them to let them eat cakes. I know she's most famous for that. Uh -huh. Or infamous for that. Yeah. And by, by cake, she actually means like not like cake, like, you know, fluffy and sugary and delicious right. confection, but like soot like that is caked on your, uh, caked around your fireplace. So, yeah, um, real nice person. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I always assumed that she was like, actually talking just like bread or something like that. Because, uh -huh. yeah. you know, they had like the bread, they found the bread and like the, um, where they were storing the food. I yeah, she yeah. talked about that, like let them have that. Uh-huh. She was talking about the soup. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of remarkably unsympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> but does Edmund Burke treat her that way? No. What does she symbolize for Burke? Beauty and grace, because she's a woman. Yeah, the beauty and grace of this vanishing era, right? And you know, all of you know, the swords of a hundred men should have leapt to her defense, right? And all that sort of thing. So yeah, so for Burke, Marie Antoinette is this symbol of the beauty of the old order that is being allowed to be degraded. Uh, by you know these ridiculous peasants. Okay, male Gothic. What is male Gothic? Yeah, but the protagonist is like an overachiever and doesn't really go by society's rules. Yeah, oh, overachiever is probably not good, but overreacher, right? Someone, yeah, overreacher. yeah. I said overreacher. Yes, <laughs> so, some someone who's. Reach exceeds his grasp, he yeah. refuses to be bound by the normal social rules, and usually ends up um, enduring some kind of spectacular fall, right? Um, so what text might we apply this to? The 100% the monk, yeah. right? That's the, the most obvious, right? Okay, good. I think I put like the Council of Toronto because mm -hmm. of the character in that. I think that's the story where the son dies, yeah, crushed by a giant ghostly helmet, yes. Right. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, the father decides he's going to divorce uh, his um, middle-aged and now infertile wife and marry the... Um, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah, so yeah, the, the Castle of Toronto actually has elements of both male and female Gothic. Right. And, you know, other subsequent, because that's the first true Gothic novel, other subsequent writers will kind of pick up elements of both and run with them. Yeah, so that, that, is, um, that is also a possibility, but not one that we actually read for the course, yeah. right? So, although, you know, I noticed, too, like, if, if y'all, I don't know if y'all want to fight over it, but there is a copy of the monk sitting out in the bookcase uh, just outside uh, this, this door here, and, you know, the, those books are free for the taking, so if anybody happens to want it, right, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably right. being traumatized. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, March to Versailles. The people from Paris. It was a lot of like mothers and their children, and mm -hmm. they were marching to Versailles because they thought there was going to be a big banquet with food, and they were all starving. Yeah. So the, yeah, the market women of Paris go and they drag their children and cannons. <laughs> and pitchforks, right, and basically anything they can get their hands on um, to uh, <clears throat> go and tell the king and queen exactly what they think of them, yes. And uh, what, uh, what text is this uh, most clearly related to? Edmund Burke's uh, um, reflection. Yeah, yeah. Um, in which yeah, Burke gives us a version of the March to Versailles, apparently a very imaginative version, mm -hmm. right? All right, terror. What is terror when compared with horror? Oh, the supernatural events come to like a rational conclusion in the end. 
Yeah, so a tale of terror is um, a gothic tale in which all of the supernatural happenings um, have some sort of rational explanation. Um, and it's usually more about kind of like solving a mystery and generating suspense than it is about horrifying the reader, right? So we didn't actually read one of these tales directly, right? But can you think of something we did read that would relate to this? the best way to go here would be the Aiken and Aiken essay that describes you know, the features of various Gothic texts and um, you know, what people are supposed to get out or feel from them. All right, and last one, female Gothic. What is female Gothic as opposed to male Gothic? Um, is a Gothic story or literary work where the protagonist is a young woman Life in Virginia and or Virginia <laughs> by some older creep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. O older creep menaces young woman. Yes. That is the, the basic pattern of a female gothic tale, right? Okay, and what what um what course texts might we apply this to? There's actually one that we read one that we read that does use the tropes of the female gothic without actually being a gothic text specifically. The reflection? Yeah, Burke's Reflections, right? yeah, where um, Marie Antoinette is chased out of her bedchamber down a secret passage by the peasants rushing in with their bayonets, right? You know, threatening her, her life and her chastity, right? You know, after they've already killed the guard. Actually, none, no guards were actually killed at Versailles on that. That's another of Burke's little creative inventions, right? But, okay, so um, any questions about any of them, about any of these terms, about the vocab quiz, or about the reading quiz, or about anything that we've already done? Are the quizzes always going to be like the unlimited time? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. If I don't mind, so like, it took five hours since I was doing laundry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I do want them to get up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you, 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 yeah. yeah I, they will never, they will never be timed. Okay. You will always have as much time as you want, like as long as you don't close the quiz down. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I think as soon as you close it down, it will um, su just submit what you have. Okay. So don't do that. But yeah, you can just you know leave it open and finish it as you uh, okay. as, as you feel like it. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I don't care how long this takes you. Any other questions about anything from before today? Will any of the books or things that ever apply to our vocab quiz be things that are connected to like the reading that's due the day after? So most of our vocab quizzes are due on Sunday, so would it be, ever be related to our Monday texts? Or no, Monday it's always going to be what you did the week before. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, I'm, I'm not, uh, in general, I'm not in the business of giving you quizzes on things you haven't learned yet. <laughs> so. Right, so does anybody then have any questions or comments about what you read for today? Like, um, like 
like the different like, like what we can get out. I don't know how to explain it, but like are we <laughs> um like for the foreshadowing and things uh-huh. like that. Are we reading for reading the poetry for that understanding or are we connected it to some like bigger picture? Okay, my my primary interest is connecting it to broader historical trends. Okay. But that doesn't necessarily have to be your particular interest, right? Okay. So is there if there's something else that you got out of this that you want to bring up and that you want to talk about, right? That's perfectly fine and all right, right? Okay. So um, what 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 were you thinking? Um, okay, so the <laughs> Letitia Barbal poem. Uh-huh. Um, in line like 61 on page 755. Okay. She mentioned the, the tempest blackening in the distant west. And this was 1811. And when they were warring with France, then like the War of 1812, uh-huh. occurred like, you know, a few months later. So. Yeah. <laughs> but was she like, was that like, Known or like assuming to be happening, seemed like the people know that, that was. Well, the, there was definitely already tension yeah. between the United States okay. and Great Britain, right? Um, over a particular issue that actually is discussed in at least two of these poems. Okay. So, one thing um, that we might again want to notice, so remember uh, what we learned about various. Uh, wars that we tend to think of as America specific from the 18th century last time The American Revolution and the French and Indian War specifically yeah. the, 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 the wars. Yeah, yeah, that um, they really Had more to do with these kind of bigger geopolitical conflicts, right? Then um, we tend to think that they're actually kind of side skirmishes in these bigger European wars, right? Our War of 1812 is a similar kind of thing, right? So the Napoleonic Wars, or what we call the Napoleonic Wars, run for a period of over 20 years, right? And they're kind of on and off conflicts between Britain and France. But our War of 1812, which lasts from 1812 to 1815, is again a part of this broader conflict. And here's how we fit into that. There are actually two ways, right? One, we once again make alliances with the French, and indeed, you know, Thomas Jefferson. Um, as president had purchased uh, a huge parcel of land from Napoleon's government, which, you now, which we re- was referred to as the Louisiana Purchase, right? Um, it now comprises you know, several states just east of the Mississippi. Um, a lot of our French allies were actually pirates, so um, that's, that's fun. But one of the main issues that the war was fought over was what's called impressment. Do any of you know what impressment is or what a press gang was? Okay, so. The basic point here is that not all of the soldiers and sailors who fought for Britain in the Napoleonic Wars were fighting voluntarily. There were press gangs that would, um, that, that is, you know, sort of like groups of, you know, recruiting sergeants um, that would go through villages usually beating a drum. And they would just kind of grab people and sign them up, right? Sometimes, particularly earlier in the war, they would offer them, you know, like kind of like a big kind of like military signing bonus, right? Like, you know, here is a bag of here is a bag of money. Sign on with the army, and there's more of this coming your way. Later on, as they get more desperate for bodies, um, they uh, just start rounding people up 
Um, basically, anybody who can march and carry a gun. Um, in fact, I think at one point, uh, like by the end of the War of 1812, the, the, by the end of the Napoleonic Wars, sorry, um, something like one fifth of all uh, British men were serving in the Army and the Navy. Now, one thing that they were doing as well, um, the, uh, the British Navy was stopping American merchant ships at sea and impressing American sailors into the British Navy. So yeah, this was the, you know, again because they they needed bodies to fight the French. So our War of 1812 was largely driven by um, Britain's need to <clears throat> basically fill its ships in this ex exceptionally long-running conflict with revolutionary France. So yeah, and so if you're kind of seeing foreshadowing there of say conflict between um, Europe and North America. Um, yeah, I think that that is actually like not, that you know, th this is a historically accurate reading of Barbald's poem, right? But I think Barbald is also a good example um, of, you remember when we, talk, when we were talking about literary periods, of kind of what happens when an author outlives the sensibilities of their period, right? So. At the time Anna Letitia Barbald writes this poem, she's almost 70 years old. Um, in fact, we've already met Anna Letitia Barbald, but under her maiden name. This is the same Anna Letitia Aiken who wrote that essay on <clears throat> the Gothic, you know, some 50 years earlier. So, she's quite an old woman when she writes this poem. And it's written in the style of the 18th century, right? We have, um, it's what's called a juvenilian satire. And a juvenilian satire is one in which, it's usually a poem typically, in which the speaker is positioned as a moralist. Who's decrying you know, the social decay or the loose moral standards um, of their current era, right, when compared to the past. So, juvenilian satire typically compares the present to the past in an unfavorable way, right? And in fact, she also makes, I don't know if any of you caught, I don't know how conversant any of you are with, with the Old Testament, um, but at the bottom of page 754, there is um, a reference to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 4, when um, she said, mentions, you know, the sword, not the sickle, reaps the harvest now. Um, it's a reference to, um, you know, in the book of Isaiah, um, <clears throat> you know, the Messiah coming to beat the sword into a plowshare and the spear into a pruning hook, right? So let's take these things that were used as weapons and beat them into agricultural implements. She's reversing that. <clears throat> process, right? That it's now the soldiers who are doing the reaping and the sowing, right? I mention this because the book of Isaiah in some some portions re resembles a juvenilian satire. Though the author probably wouldn't, the author of the book of Isaiah would not have recognized any similarity. Um, okay. So, what else did you guys notice about these poems? they seem to be anti-war to you? Um, 
I think that the Barbold poem is pretty obvious, right? Oh, the one more thing I wanted to point out about the style of this before we continue. We'll go back to your comment in just a second. Um, it's written in what are called, her and this is one of the ways in which the poem is old fashioned. It's written in what are called heroic couplets. I'm going to assume that none of you have ever heard this term before. I know what a couplet is. Like okay. A couplet. Okay, what's a rhyming couplet? It's a line, um, parts of a poem, and they end with the same, they have the same rhyming scheme. Yeah, yeah, it's like an A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D rhyme, right? So yeah, afar, war, ear, fear, fate, state, force, course, right? So yeah, the, each, each, uh, each line, um, each couplet is a kind of self-contained unit, right, with a finished thought. And heroic couplets are the, prime, the dominant form of British poetry in the 18th century. So again, by 1812, this is old fashioned. And they are end rhymed pentameter, right? That is five foot, typically ten syllable couplets. Uh, that each represent complete thoughts. So, you know, while a couple sets of couplets might, you know, develop a particular theme, um, on the whole, each couplet is going to be a kind of self-contained idea. Okay, so back to what you were saying about these poems being anti-war rhyming. Sorry about the digression. Oh, um, <laughs> they all seem to be about, like, the, like the woes after, like, the soldiers. Uh -huh. Like the PTSD that soldiers were <laughs> okay. after the wars. Like, yeah, the discharged soldier, the Wordsworth poem in particular, yeah, it seems to be about what happens to a soldier once he's no longer any good for fighting, right? Or that, or like the, the losing the soldier, I know like two, two of them were like that, like losing the soldier uh -huh. and like the widows. Like that. I think they were trying to, I know they were probably spoken in motion. Uh -huh. like on that part, like, yeah, you, you're winning these battles, but at what cost? Yeah, yeah, I think that, yeah, the Robert Southey poem in particular. Um, Southey is um, a poet who in later life will develop um, into um, a pretty reactionary, like far right wing for the period kind of guy. But it, in his youth, he's a radical, right? And I think one thing that we should note here is that among particularly the younger romantics, there was actually, a, at least initially, a good deal of admiration for Napoleon, which wouldn't have been quite kosher in British life at the time, right? But yeah, like a lot of younger educated men in particular saw a lot of potential in the revolution. And then in the figure of Napoleon specifically, right, you know, here was a guy who you know came just kind of out of the middle classes and distinguished himself through talent, ambition, um, and intelligence, right? And you know managed to work his way up to the top of the pyramid. Now, the music I was playing at the beginning of class, uh, Beethoven's Third Symphony. You know, this is the Eroica, the Heroic Symphony. Note that there is no T in the middle of the word, right? I know it's our T. Yeah, <laughs> that's because, because your brain tends to fill that in, right? No, yes, this is heroica in French, you know, heroic. Um, and yeah, uh, Beethoven dedicated this heroic symphony to Napoleon. Now, he took back that dedication uh, when Napoleon's uh, siege of Vienna began. <laughs> And suddenly, you know, the war was brought to where he lived. Um, <clears throat> Napoleon didn't seem like such a great guy then. But yeah, um, there is on like, kind of like on both sides of the channel here, in Britain and in France, um, this kind of renewed hero worship um, that expresses itself partly in like a 
a flurry of monument building in the immediate aftermath of the war. So to give you a couple of examples of this, I want to show you some pictures. Just who doesn't like looking at pictures, right? recognize this uh, one-handed gentleman with a sword standing on a coil of rope in a British naval uniform? Okay. If you were, if you were English, you would <laughs> definitely recognize this man. Especially if you were a 19th century English person when he was at kind of the value of Spain um, admiration. So this is Admiral Horatio Nelson. And Admiral Nelson is now perhaps better known to Americans as one of the captain's cousins, right? There is a brand of inexpensive spiced rum that bears his name and likeness on the bottle. Um, but Nelson is the hero of the Battle of Trafalgar. In fact, this, this particular statue stands on top of an enormous column in Trafalgar Square in London, right? So the square is named for the battle. And um, <clears throat> this is in 1805, and Nelson was killed in this particular battle. Now, one of the reasons I mention this is because um, Nelson's funeral was an enormous state affair. Right, you know, there were church bells ringing throughout England. Um, you know, the streets were filled with mourners. Um, you know, there was a, you know, an enormous military parade in which the casket was conveyed to its resting place in Westminster Abbey, where kings, heroes, and poets are all laid to rest. Right. So, <clears throat> Nelson's funeral is an enormous public celebration of the victory of the Battle of Trafalgar, which also tends to kind of elide um, some of the man's little you know, sort of personal peccadillos. For example, that he, he made his reputation defending slave estates in the West Indies. Um, and uh, he also um, spent a lot of unsupervised time with other men's wives. But yeah, so like there are Nelson's pillars that are built in the early 19th century all over Britain and Ireland. In fact, one of the most famous, one of the earliest to go up uh, was in Dublin. That's not the one. This is what I'm looking for. Um, in the middle of the main street running through uh, North Dublin, which was then called Sackville Street. It's now called O'Connell Street. And this is what it looked like when it was intact. Then in 1966, the IRA blew it up. So we can say, like, historically, like, you know, we can relate this actually kind of to our present moment, right? You know, where historically, monuments um, represent what a, like, what a nation or what a people thinks of itself at a particular moment in time, right? And Ireland in the 1960s um, is not willing to accept a monument to a British naval hero um, who was kind of best known for his defense of what the IRA regarded as imperialist, um, imperialist practices, right? Now, the other great hero of the uh, Napoleonic Wars, the very British hero of the Napoleonic Wars, is one 
Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, um, who was actually born in Dublin and is memorialized there by a giant obelisk in the middle of a public park called Phoenix Park. So this is actually a full like obelisks originate in Egypt. And this is one of those um, kind of exotic structures that we see uh, 18th century aristocrats building in their gardens, right? It's one of the, as a kind of Gothic folly. And in these Wellington monuments, we see a Gothic folly made enormous and elevated into public monument. And this is the uh, equestrian statue of Wellington um, in Glasgow, in Scotland. And as you can see, uh, people like to put traffic cones on it. Um, so, you know, again, with like the, the level of respect for English heroes of the war, outside of England specifically, um, tends to be, um, in Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, they're treated a lot more irreverently, right? Even though this statue likely wouldn't have been treated so reverently, in, say, 1820. I think in this particular case, the, the yellow and blue on the traffic cone are supposed to represent solidarity with Ukraine. Now, the other interesting um, feet, like landscape feature that starts popping up across Britain is a kind of tower, a specific species of squat round tower that we now see all over the English coast, and, in, and as well as in Ireland and the Channel Islands. Um, these are called Martello Towers. And <clears throat> they're essentially kind of like designed as watchtowers, right? You know, they're, um, you're supposed to be able to stand on that flat roof and look out over the sea, and if any French people happen to be coming across the English Channel, um, you can spot them, right? And the French never actually end up invading England, right? This is one thing to note, is that you know, despite England's leading role in the Napoleonic Wars, no enemy soldier ever sets foot on English soil. The war is fought entirely in other places, right? In the Caribbean, in mainland Europe, even you know there's a, a side conflict in India as well, right? But England, by virtue of its status as island, right, remains untouched. And this is actually something that the Barbald poem in particular, seems um, interested in. Um, can we turn to page 755, and can I get one of you to start reading for us from line 39? Um, and thinks thou, Britain. I will. Thank you. Okay. And thinks thou, Britain, still to sit at ease, an island queen amidst thy subject seas, while in Vex billows and their distant roar, but soothe thy slumbers and but kiss thy shore. To sport in world wars while danger keeps aloof, thy grass turf unbruised by hostile hoof. To sing thy flatterers, to sing thy flatterers, but Britain know, thou who hast shared the guilt must share the wall. Nor distant is the hour, low murmurs spread, and whispered fears creating what they dread. Ruin as with an earthquake shock is here, there the heart witherings of unuttered fear, and that sad death whence most affection leaves, with sickness only of the soul proceeds. Thy baseless wealth dissolves in air away, like mist that melt before the morning ray. No more on crowded mart or busy street, friends being friends, with cheerful hurry greet. Sad on the ground thy princely merchants bend, their altar looks and evil days portend, and folds their arm, arms and watch with anxious breast, the tempest blackening in the distant west. Okay, so we can uh, stop there, right? So I think we're ending with that part that you referenced at the beginning of class, right? But what seems to be the overall argument that Barbald is making 
in this first paragraph. What kind of picture of, of England and English security is she painting here? It seems though like um, she's saying, yeah, we haven't been invaded yet, <laughs> but like you keep getting in wars, it soon happens, especially with conflicts in the West. Uh huh. Um, and it's like long before someone, if not France, maybe the United States invades Britain. Like we're sitting perch, you know, on the perch now, but mm -hmm. now we keep bothering everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like we, we keep kicking a hornet's nest, right. right? And we keep expecting that because we're on an island that um, we're hard to invade. But you keep stirring the pot, you keep kicking that hornet's nest, and eventually you're going to get stung, right? And British security right, obtained in part through geographical isolation um, is a fragile thing. And I think that like, well, the reason I bring this up in, uh, like in talking about these Martello Towers is the fact that they were building these defensive structures all over the island shows that like whatever kind of other public display they were making, there was a genuine feeling of insecurity that motivated this, right? right. That motivates, um, particularly you know, putting these up in places that faced France, or in places um, that had traditionally been sympathetic to France, like Ireland. Um, I think it's particularly telling there are a lot of these, again, like in the Channel Islands, which are right in the English Channel between um, Britain and France. All right, so <clears throat> where was I going to go with this? <laughs> okay, well, what? Well, why don't we give uh, give give you all a chance to um, a chance to chime in here? Like what? So, does anybody have any questions? Like, what do y'all think of this so far? Are there other thoughts you have about these poems? when it was talking about um, even in like the introduction to all of these different poems the part that uh -huh. was just romantic literature and wartime and it was talking about the different perspectives and so there was like the anti-war side and there was the the side almost mm -hmm. like making it heroic but there was some some other um, sentence that said something about how some people viewed it almost as a holy war like a, a almost with a religious thing to it and I thought uh -huh. there was another I made a note on it in, um, I think it's Robert Southey. Yes. Yeah. Um, there's several different lines that actually quote things from scripture that just don't have quotation marks on it. So like good tidings of great joy, and that's uh -huh. in the Christmas story and some of those other sure. things. And then a lot of these other ones, there's sections talking about um, like uh, the much longer poem by Wordsworth. And I think it's line 164, talking about, like, my trust is in the God of heaven. And so, like, okay. how faith is also interwoven yeah. into a lot of the story of the war and the opinions made yeah. in there. And I, and I think, yeah, probably one thing to do is that, like, any of these, like, kind of, like, little even kind of passing biblical allusions, that, yeah, the, the King James Bible in particular would have been part of the education um, of just about any of these writers, right? Um, you know, the expectation uh, for Catholics typically was that you would have the Bible read to you, or parts of it read by the priest, often in Latin, which you couldn't understand anyway. Um, whereas uh, the Protestant sects have always encouraged uh, people to read the Bible themselves. Right? In fact, like the whole 
you know, the Protestant Reformation begins with Martin Luther translating uh, the Gospels into German, right? So, um, yeah, so <clears throat> the fact that, like, these guys will kind of casually toss out biblical-sounding phrases, um, yeah, that's very typical um, of educated people of their generation. Um, but I think one thing I think that we might focus on in the study poem here is the church bells that begin it, right? Before we have, the tidings of joy, good tidings of great joy. What, for what reasons do church bells typically ring? Someone gets married. <laughs> okay, yeah, a wedding, right? All right, why are they being wrong in this case, in the specific instance of this poem? What are the church bells ringing for? The ships and the people coming back home? Yeah, to celebrate a victory, right? And this was something that was pretty common during the Napoleonic Wars, right? When there was a great victory, or something that was regarded as a great victory, um, once news of it reached, um, reached England, right? Then you know, church bells across the country would start ringing, right? Now, what else do we remember about English churches and say how they're governed? The king was considered like the head of it. Yeah, the church is part of the machinery of state, right? There is no separation of church and state here. So there's a combination here of religious celebration with um, you know, state occasion, right? Now, what's one other reason why church bells are rung, though they're not typically rung joyously on these kinds of occasions? Yeah, you also ring the church bells for a funeral, right? We look at the way this, you know, the, these first two lines are written here, right? Hark, how the church bell's thundering harmony stuns the glad ear. Do you notice anything weird about that line or the way it's phrased? Is there a word that stands out here that seems strange or out of place? Thundering. Pardon? Thundering. Okay, thundering maybe. Or stun the glad ear. Okay, yeah, stuns. <laughs> yeah, do, do we usually think of you know something that we're meant to celebrate as something that stuns us? No. Yeah, I mean like the, you know, it's something like the, the loud bells, um, the thundering harmony stuns. The, like, there's something painful about it, right? There's pain mixed in with celebration. I think, yeah, that's the, the church bells here are kind of, you know, ambiguous because we know about, the, you know, as we come to know, become, the signifier becomes more ambiguous as we come to know about the death here, right? So this public celebration of a victory is also, at least on some level, the funeral of this sailor who has died at sea. So... <clears throat> What are we told about this sailor? Can, can I get somebody to start reading from around line 11 for us? Page 752. Um, there was one who died in that day's glory, whose obscure name no proud historian's page will chronicle. Peace to his honest soul. I read his name. I read his name. T'was in a list of slaughter, and blessed God. The sound was not familiar to my ear, but it was told me after that that this man was one whom lawful violence had forced from his own home and wife and little ones, 
who by his labor lived, that he was one whose uncorrupted heart could keenly feel a husband's love, a father's anxiousness, that from the wages of his toil he fed, the distant dear ones, and would talk of them at midnight when he trod the silent deck with him he valued, talk of them of joys that he had known, O oh God, and of the hour when they should meet again to his full heart, his manly heart at last would overflow, even like a child with very timidness. Okay, let's pause here for a second. Right? So what do we know about how this guy came to be a soldier in ours? How, how he came to be a sailor? And, uh, the impressment sounds like. Yeah, this guy was impressed, right? He didn't volunteer, he didn't sign up. The recruiter came with a drum, said, you know, come on me lad, and uh, he had to go, right? <clears throat> So yeah, he's not a volunteer. He's basically a draftee, right? Um, and what else do we, like? What else are we kind of told here about this guy's personality? What characteristic does he seem to possess that we may have already talked about in terms of, like, say, moral development? He was one whose uncorrupted heart could keenly feel a husband's love, a father's anxiousness, that from the wages of his toil he fed the distant dear ones. Huh. Maybe like the chivalry, possibly, that we talked about in one of our other lessons? Well, chivalry tends to be a kind of specifically aristocratic value. It is often associated with legitimate violence, right? Oh. You know, if we want to frame that. Yeah, what, what were you going to say, Ryan? Well, uh, he seems like, like a common man, like um, a husband and a father. Mm -hmm. um, what about the depth of his feelings? Husband's love, a father's anxiousness. Are we getting around at the sensibility? <laughs> yes, he's a man of sensibility, right? Or was a man of sensibility, right? A man of, of keen and deep feeling. Suddenly it came, and merciful the ball of death, for it came suddenly and shattered him, and left no moment's agonizing thought on those he loved so well. He, ocean deep, now lies at rest. So, well, one, what do we know about the possibility of a real funeral here? Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah he, he's lost at sea, right? You know, the body is not recoverable. So there's a kind of lack of closure there uh, for the widow and children left at home. And why is it, why, like, why do you think um, so he calls the ball of death and the cannonball that kills the guy merciful? Particularly if we think about this in terms of like if this is a man of sensibility, someone who keenly, you know, fe keenly feels and thinks. Why is being quickly taken out of this world by a cannonball merciful? So he does not like to suffer and feel the pain of death. Um, it's mm -hmm. like a quick and it's not easy, but like a quick thing that happens to him. Yeah. In particular, do, do, does Southey seem to suggest that this guy would dwell on his own pains as he died? Probably more of his family. Yeah, this was someone who was focused on his wife and children, right? And um, not so much on 
<clears throat> you know, really just like people like getting, you know, getting back home, you know, returning, you know, to the old family homestead and all that. Um, so I want to show you. This is what we're looking. For. This is um, a series of cartoons by the artist James Gilray, and Gilray. I mean, this, this actually relates particularly to the Sudney poem and also to the Wordsworth poem. So Gilray was an artist on the government payroll. And a lot of what he draws kind of looks like government propaganda, whether kind of like anti-revolutionary um, or you know, pro or like for example, here's another cartoon of his um, where we see um, Napoleon and the British Prime Minister William Pitt carving up the world like a plum pudding. And what do we notice about the way Napoleon is depicted here? What does he look like? Okay. Yeah, he's a, t a tiny man in an enormous hat, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen, there's a, like a, a kind of comedy fantasy movie from the 80s called Time Bandits. It's about these um, dwarves who work for God, um, who are apparently like they're they're traveling through uh, these different little time doors, trying to become um, you know successful robbers, um, and they land uh, in Napoleon's conquest of Italy, and the actor Ian Holm plays a Napoleon who is like obsessed with proving that five foot one isn't short. <laughs> His favorite thing to do is watch things that are smaller than him beat each other up. But, but like, Gilray actually helps create this image of Napoleon in the public imagination, right? By always drawing him as a little man in a big hat. Napoleon was actually of like completely average height for a man of his, his time, right? But this image lingers in the public consciousness. And this was the kind of, this was more the kind of thing, this was the kind of thing Gilray was typically paid to draw, right, by the government. Now this John Bull sequence, right, John Bull's progress, is a little bit more critical, right? So John Bull, and we're going to see this figure again, especially when we talk about World War I. John Bull in the late 18th and early 19th centuries is this kind of like British everyman figure, right? The kind of like, you know, stout, well-fed, um, happy but not particularly curious um, English countrymen, right? And here we see John Bull happy. And what does John Bull's happy life look like? The one on the top left of him. Yeah, this is John Bull happy, yes. Okay. He's on the fire in a rocking chair, seems to be. Uh-huh. At home, someone in the kitchen eating food, I guess. Right? Yeah, it looks like his, the, the, the daughter or the maid is coming and bringing in milk, right? Mm -hmm. To churn the butter. His wife is spinning yarn. The kids look like they're playing with a pet bird. Um, he's got a dog and cat sleeping at his feet, and he's sitting there with a little jug of ale in front of the fire, fat and happy, fast asleep, right? <laughs> Everything's great. So the, the sleep kind of represents complacency, right? right? And then we see him marching off to the wars, right? He's got his, his you know, shiny new uniform and his bayonet. Um, and what do we notice about the reaction of his family to him you know, like catching war fever? They're like bowing. <laughs> they're distraught. <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're trying to pull him back, right? Like, don't go. This John Bull going to the wars, and here we see John Bull's property in danger, right? So what's happening now that John Bull is off fighting in the wars? What do we see here in this? Um, I guess you probably don't know what this symbol would represent, but it's a pawnbroker shop. Oh, they're pawning their belongings. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, they're taking all of their stuff, particularly like all the stuff that they used that was productive, right? The spinning wheel, the butter churn, right? right. They've got a pawn all of it. 
because the, the main breadwinner in support of the family is no longer sleeping with his mug of ale in front of the fire. And here we see John Bull's glorious return. Yeah, and it's, it's 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 certainly intended to be right. It's like like this is what like, and I think why do you think we see John Bull's disintegration paired with the families? Why does this? Why, you know why do you think Gilray gives us both here? What's the basic argument of this four panel cartoon? Like that the war touched the whole family, like it touched the people on the battlefield and left them in a bad state, but it also left the families at home in bad positions. Yeah. John Bull himself is coming home with one eye and one leg. His uniform, third leg. apparently he's been made an officer now. Right? He's got, you know, a fancier hat and coat, although everything's looking threadbare. But yeah, he's coming home to a starved and wild-looking family, right, who weren't able to care for themselves uh, or support themselves while he was gone. So yeah, the basic argument here is that by sending all of the able-bodied men off to fight in wars, you are robbing families of their main support and sustenance. And <clears throat> given the state of John Bull when he comes home, are they ever likely to return to their former prosperity? Yeah, and I think this is kind of where, particularly the end of um, Southey's poem is trending, right? You know, when he talks about, you know, be a, be a comfort to the widow and all that sort of thing. He's addressing God. Um, but uh, yeah, he is, you know, he's worried about what is going to happen to this man's family now that he's gone. All right, so um, we're running a little short on time here. Does anybody have any questions about it? We haven't really talked about the Wordsworth poem. Does anybody have any quick questions about that poem? With the, um, the description of the, the soldier, and also he mentioned the dog, but the master, like once or twice. And uh -huh. there's some sort of connection between that soldier and this dog that he mentioned. Because like, he would mention them like together. Uh huh. So is there like some sort of connection between the two? Yeah, well, the, the soldier is afraid of the dog, right? Okay. And that's why he doesn't um, go into the village, right? Although the, the dog is continually howling right. as long as the soldier is there, right? So what, why does somebody keep a mastiff, in particular, tied up outside of a little wooden house? For the mastiff, they're like huge, aren't they? Like yeah, humongous. yeah. Now, the, the, most of them are sweethearts, yeah. right? You know, I've, 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 never, I've never met a mastiff that wasn't perfectly gentle. But yeah, they're big, imposing guard dogs, right? They're kind of bred to be guard dogs. And so what that the soldier is afraid to go into the village because of the guard dog? What does that suggest about the soldier's uh, status in relation to the ordinary settled country people? This is like the village where he was from, right? He's not from us. Oh, he's, he's, he's on his way. He's on his way home. Basically, the ship just dropped him off, and he's walking, right? Okay. Um, so, um, I think this is the thing to think about with this poem, right? It's like, so what that the soldier never goes into the village, and even you know when he does, like when Wordsworth finds him a place to stay, right? It's out in kind of like the outer bounds, right? right? And he kind of like turns over responsibility for this guy to someone else, right? And is himself 
right, afraid when he sees this soldier, right? I think it's also probably important, and we'll kind of wrap up here, that he you know, refers to these soldiers frequently with words like ghostly. Right? I don't think we're meant to like, regard the soldier as actually dead or actually a ghost, but I think like the idea of um, you know, the ordinary English citizen being haunted by the gaunt, sickly figure of a soldier who's been discharged from wars in the tropics, right? I think that that's probably relevant, right? And it's like a kind of almost like a figure, kind of like pointing, you know, pointing at you and pointing out your your guilt and your complicity in his suffering, right? He's like an outsider, like yeah, from the rest of the society or the village and mm -hmm. everyone else. Yeah. And remains so, right? right? Okay, so we are out of time. Um, so I'm going to give you all the uh, reading questions for next time. We're going to be uh, reading a couple of texts uh, written <clears throat> about British participation in the slave trade. Um, the first two are written by people who are active abolitionists. Um, the third is written by someone who, at least at the time he wrote that piece, was in favor of maintaining the trade. Um, so Clarkson and Coleridge are abolitionists. Cobbett is decidedly not. But they do all alliterate nicely, don't they? Clarkson, Coleridge, Cobbett. <laughs>